Let's go! What differentiates Sports Science Lab from any other training facility that I know of is that it attempts to address all the specific needs that an athlete will present to you. Athleticism entails a lot of different abilities. You have to have balance, rhythm, timing, coordination. You need to be able to run quickly, jump higher. Absolute strength will never cover it. Even if that strength modality was the one that you would primarily need in sports, which it never is, it falls way short of addressing all the other needs an athlete has. Joint mobility, muscle flexibility, all these things add up to being a great athlete. When you try to define what athleticism is, the first thing you start with is movement. The ability to change direction, the ability to accelerate, the ability to jump, all these things are going to add up into being a better athlete in your sport. There really isn't any sport that doesn't require it. It doesn't matter if it's a baseball player, an MMA fighter, basketball player, football player, tennis, soccer, golf. All these things revolve around the ability to control your limbs in space at high rates of speed. What we try to do is specify that to the sport that you have, and we start by building your athleticism up from your feet. Your feet are what control your movement. They're the only thing touching the ground. So all the feedback your brain gets comes from the nerve endings in your feet and telling you how to move. We start with the proprioceptive component that happens in your feet, and your body is able to figure out how to control itself and how to move. And from there, you just start building up the chain. Lots of people talk about having core strength as being something that they do. Well, the reason you have to have it is that you have four limbs, and in sports, the power that they can generate is dependent upon their ability to stretch away from your core. And if your core strength is weak, then they will not be able to pull against something that's stable, and therefore their force is going to be reduced. So what separates the Sports Science Lab is the comprehensive nature to which we're able to address all the athletes' needs. Sports Science Lab exists because we're trying to find the best possible methods to train athletes in terms of performance. The measuring stick that we have here is entirely based on the gains they get that directly impact their performance on the field or the track or in the pool, on a tennis court, a football field, it doesn't matter. And how this all started really was I played a lot of different sports growing up, a seven through high school, hockey being the primary sport I was trained for. And I always had an obsession with trying to figure out the biomechanics of how people did things. Whether it was how they ran, how they jumped, how they shot a basketball, or a slap shot, which is obviously a lot greater interest to me. By watching the best do things, I started noticing patterns to different people's movement, to how they would swing a bat, how they would throw something. And it became very obvious that there were laws of biomechanics that people followed, especially at the elitist levels of sports. The more that I started watching each and every sport, the more it became apparent that everybody was doing the same thing. It was just a different sport that they were applying it to. As I started researching that more, and once I came across Leonardo da Vinci's work, his Vitruvian Man showed that there's mathematical proportion to the human body. Once you realize that there's proportion to something geometrically, you know that there's only certain angles that it can work at maximally. And in humans, you'll always see 90 degree angles to it, whether it's from the foot to the knee, from the knee to the shoulder, whether it's how the arm internally rotates when you're throwing. You'll always be able to find that if you understand what you're looking at. Those simple principles actually reveal a lot. If you understand the importance of patterning the brain properly, that that's going to produce the greatest amount of skill and also your most efficient movement, then you know that all sports performance training has to be focused in that area. It has to be all-encompassing. And the strength gains and the strength modalities used should be mimicking to the best of your ability what those movements are going to be in someone's sport. What we try to do here is to make sure that all aspects of what an athlete's going to need from his skill sets to the physical pure abilities of his body are taken into consideration.
very smart. In all of our plyometric movements, which dominate sports, whether it's running, jumping, lateral movement, there's always a eccentric stretch preceding the concentric firing. And the higher that stretch speed is, the greater the force of the concentric contraction. That requires the elastic properties to be at their maximum. And that's in the tendon, in the fascia, and in the muscle itself. The other thing is, is that there's a misconception in the sports performance world in terms of what power is and how you actually get it. When you're producing the highest rates of force for a human body, it's because the foot, knee, hip, and the shoulder and the arms all properly align themselves. And they align themselves in specific angles to be able to produce this force. So logically, you would then say that it would be best to be able to train somebody in those angles consistently. And if you can as closely mimic the joint angles needed to produce the maximal rate of force in your training protocol, that would be the smartest way to go about it. And that's what we attempt to do here. Specifically using the throw-offs that we do, that is applied force in a very small amount of time. That's as close as we've been able to come in terms of mimicking the rate of force produced in running or jumping. And we've seen tremendous increases in people's vertical and speed in this application alone. If the biomechanic is right, then you're essentially using strength through movement. And the more it's patterned, it starts developing greater strength in that movement range because you improve the neural capabilities of doing that single action. Running, for instance, has a specific sequence to it. When the foot strikes the ground and the foot pushes off, there was a Russian Olympic weightlifter who had hypothesized that the foot was producing more force in the get off and running and jumping. And no one believed him at first, and then they started testing it and found out he was correct. For instance, Usain Bolt, when he pushes off the ground, produces about 1,200 pounds of force in 0 0.08 tenths of a second. But that's done through a stretch speed. He's not under intense eccentric load that he has to resist to be able to snap back. What his muscles are able to do is stretch out and fire back very quickly and explosively. It's a completely opposite paradigm. In the running mechanic, it's important to understand that what you're watching on film and what a leg is doing are two completely different things. The foot pushes off and it extends. And the reason people think that there's forced dorsiflexion is they can see the recoil effect of the foot coming back to neutral after it's pushed off the ground. It's been full extension and then the foot comes back to neutral. No one is actually physically trying to lift their foot up and yet that gets taught worldwide to people. The next thing is this concept of knee drive. Once the foot is pushed off the ground, the hamstring contracts, creating knee bend. And as the other foot now hits the ground and propels you forward, that makes it look like the other knee is driving up and forward. It's not. It's in a stationary position until the quad then contracts, dropping the foot below the knee. Once the foot pushes off the ground and the hamstrings contracted, what then further brings the knee back up is the contraction of the psoas muscle. It's not actually the knee trying to lift up. The psoas has been fully extended and it's at a full stretch. And then you contract it and it comes back to its neutral position again. It's then that the quad lets go and drops the foot down below the knee. So it becomes this sequential movement pattern. And it's very easy to see in Usain Bolt, he does it perfectly, in that his feet are literally firing from one to the next to the next to the next. He is not driving his knee forward. That would roll his pelvis underneath him, and he would now land in a position that is not optimal for producing force for a leg. The ability to relax muscles, allow them to fire at the right time and in the right sequence, is the primary important aspect that you need to train in improving rate of force for running. Mastering the skill sets is such an important factor in achieving athletic excellence. Because if you look at any type of jumping, you'll notice that when somebody pushes off into a takeoff and a jump, that they're in a very relaxed state as the muscle is able to lengthen out. And the faster that they can push, into their takeoff leg, the faster the muscles will stretch out and then they snap back, producing a higher vertical. If it's football and you're a quarterback, it's your ability to throw and understanding what the mechanics of that are and then being able to maximize not only velocity but accuracy. The thing that dominates any type of rugby game is your ability to run. And yet, almost all the training systems around focus primarily on muscle hypertrophy not the ability to run, and certainly not the ability to change direction. 
to me, that's just a fundamental mistake. The ability to move, to be able to evade, and especially be able to evade major contact is an incredible skill that's needed, number one, for injury prevention, but also for pure performance reasons. We have been led to believe that if you do have the best power clean or the best squat or the best bench press, that therefore you're the best athlete. And that's never the case. Anybody that doesn't believe that hasn't been around enough sports teams where they test consistently who is the best athlete. The guys that are their best players are number one are on the field all the time and they're hurt the least. But also it's the best player is the one that can handle the most adversity. And adversity being always being able to move, change direction, and handle anything their sport may be able to throw at them. So there has to be an enormous amount of time spent on perfecting those. Because if they're not, you're gonna fall short in any type of competitive environment. Until two things are established within a training system and that you number one have to be training the running mechanics correctly, but your system also has to be set up to maximally produce force within those mechanics. And if you do both of those things, not only are you going to get an increase in performance, but you're also going to get a dramatic reduction in injury rates. So as I started noticing the common themes that existed throughout the sports, obviously as being an athlete myself, I was always exposed to the different training system. For me personally, I really was never around trainers or a training system that was able to advance my athletic ability more than I had already advanced it on my own. And when I look back at the history of how I was raised, my father put me in ballet class when I was five years old. I was then put in figure skating after that. And I was allowed to play hockey by the time I was seven. And the movement abilities that I had the first time that I stepped into a competitive arena far exceeded everybody else's. And it's just I had been trained better. Of course, we all assume that it's genetics, but all of the current research has shown, and when I say current, this research was available 40 years ago, but it's now more prominent in books like The Outliers or The Talent Code or Talents Overrated, any of these books that have tried to explain people that have achieved great things in anything in life, whether it's sports or music or computers or anything, there's an extraordinary length and period of time that it takes for them to master what they're doing. It's thousands and thousands of hours that it takes for the body to properly train the movement pattern and to make it into a conditioned reflex. And the reason for that is that the frequencies of the nerves, they actually get a myelin sheath around them that thickens over time and it improves the signal ability in terms of its connecting on either end. That's been proven over and over for years. Spartak in Russia is a good example of people that understand that. When they're training tennis players, they focus on nothing but technique, footwork, things like that, that really will impact their tennis player's ability. They understand that athleticism is a trainable skill. That's the biggest gap that exists in the United States. Athleticism is assumed to be a trait that you're born with, and when in fact it's a trait that you train over time and learn to perfect. What our sports training systems have evolved into is into just how much weight you can lift. Well, those weightlifting patterns have nothing to do with being able to throw a baseball, hit a baseball, jumping, running, a slap shot, a serve in tennis, a golf swing. They're absolute opposite paradigm. And by that I mean in sports performance, the most important thing that you'll ever improve if you're doing any type of resistance training is what's called rate of force production. How fast can I apply the force? And because the traditional weightlifting that's used, such as a power cling, a conventional squat, or a bench press, you are given unlimited amount of time to apply that force. Well, that's simply not applicable to sports in any way because it's always the athlete that can apply the force in the shortest amount of time that's your best athlete. When we now know how much time it takes to be able to train that ability, then you certainly don't want to be spending your time training things in an incorrect movement pattern that you have to then correct. Well, there's this long-held belief that you can convert absolute strength to power and knowing for a biological and physiological fact that strength is a neurological ability. It is not the muscle's mass that produces its power or speed strength or any of those abilities. It's the nervous system's ability to recruit the muscle fibers in that pattern at a precise time and in a precise amount of time to produce the most amount of force in the shortest amount of time possible. That is going to be the most important thing that you can achieve in terms of a sports performance training. 
That and replicating the proper movement patterns in terms of running, jumping, hitting, all the other things that we call athletic. The most dominating factors of any athlete are their movement abilities. They're not only straight ahead, but the ability to change direction and the ability to use their arms and limbs in different ranges of motion in space at a high rate of speed. Those are your best performers every single time. The current system that we have in the United States and worldwide really is almost predominantly focused on improving muscle hypertrophy size. And they do that without any real focus on what the purpose is. If there was a direct correlation between muscle mass and the rate of force production increase, well then of course you would do that. There's in fact an inverse relationship with that in that the greater the mass increase, the lower the rate of force production and certainly the lower the speed. And anybody that doubts that hasn't done any of their homework in terms of the research that was done by Yuri Verkashansky. He proved over and over again that the obsession with maximal heavy weightlifting negated speed every time. And it initiates a different muscle sequencing. It becomes very non-functional in its application to sports, both in the sequence of it and in the application of time that it takes to do that movement. Again, if you go back to logic and how a human body is built, humans are approximately 70% water. They have a very dense bone structure held together by very inelastic ligaments so that the bones don't separate. The muscles and tendons lay over top of the bones and they provide its working power. The blood and oxygen then delivers the energy to the muscle complex and the central nervous system dictates how they all work together sequentially. On that premise, it's not very hard to figure out that if you're constantly searching for maximal weightlifting, that there's an extreme danger in injuring people because of the vulnerability of their joints and their connective tissue. When your system is built around the fact that you have to do your exercises in a perfect sequence to be able to avoid injury, clearly there's something wrong with it. And name a sport where someone stands still other than Olympic weightlifting with a 400 pound bar on their back. That doesn't happen. And the joint alignment is absolutely incorrect in terms of producing maximal force for a human. Because of the loading of the heel, it excessively loads the quads, the spine is in the wrong angle. It does not properly mimic the maximal joint angle for running, jumping, or anything else. And there is a way to do that effectively without hurting people. What we've attempted to do here is to quantify, number one, what are all the needs that an athlete has? Well, he's gonna need balance. He's gonna need rhythm. He's gonna need coordination. He's, of course, gonna need flexibility. He's gonna need joint mobility. He's certainly gonna need strength, but he's gonna need all the types of different strength, from absolute strength to speed strength to explosive reactive strength, accelerating strength all the different parameters that an athlete has to use in any type of sport. And one of the fundamental flaws that exists within a conventional weight system is that all the movement patterns, when you look at how anyone does anything, revolves around a plyometric principle. Plyometrics is a type of exercise training that is designed to produce fast, powerful movements and improve the functions of the nervous system, generally for the purpose of improving performance in sports. Now worldwide, typically what a plyometric exercise means to people is depth jumps, weighted ball throws, things like that. What we're able to do here is to take the plyometric strength training to another level by incorporating a machine that has a movable arm that moves at an extraordinarily high rate of speed. The athlete will have to put his muscles on stretch first to produce a concentric contraction, and that the faster he's able to stretch those muscles out, the more explosive the contraction is. The slower they stretch them out, the slower the contraction is. And therein lies the fundamental flaw in all conventional weight systems. Because if you're slowly stretching out something that under competitive environments requires you to stretch at a high rate of speed, well logic would have to tell you that then you're not training for your sport properly. Why would you not be mimicking the very things that you need to do in your sport to produce that force in that amount of time. That's what we try to do here. We also try to make sure that we're addressing the injury prevention from the standpoint of not doing anything in our training modality that could possibly hurt anybody. 
plyometrics, it's always been assumed that you're increasing the injury rates. That's actually false. But plyometrics, if done correctly, reduces injury because it strengthens the connective tissue. Rapid loads, when they're applied quickly, the energy is released. Much like when a ball bounces along the ground, it compresses on the one side, and as soon as it comes off the ground, it restores to its shape. If you just sat pushing on the ball, well, it would compress the ball. That's the same thing that happens to your muscle tissue. So plyometrics not only improves power output, but it actually reduces injuries because you're strengthening the connective tissue that's associated with that muscle. It's about producing greater force through the use and storage of elastic energy, and that entirely revolves around training not only the muscle, but the tendon properly to be able to do that. So last year I was contacted by Alfred Reeder who runs PVM Nutritional Sciences. Their company was contracted to train the Cheetahs, one of the five professional rugby franchises in South Africa. And their primary goal was, number one, to reduce the number of injuries that the team was getting, and also then to subsequently improve their performance by that, their speed, their ability to move, change direction, those type of things. So last fall they came here and we spent two weeks going over the entire system. They then took it back to South Africa to start using the system with the cheetahs. And the interesting thing about this is that what they started employing was just the basic principles that we use with the ball work program, for instance, which trains the dynamic stretching abilities of the limbs, different ranges of motion, different planes of movement, the water therapy program, which is extraordinarily successful at reducing not only soft tissue injuries, but catastrophic injuries in the knee and in the shoulders and because it restores the joint mobility as well as the flexibility within the muscles and it does so in so many different ranges of motion that it prepares you for almost anything that comes up in your sport. And also the footwork program in terms of strengthening the feet and your ability to change direction then is directly correlated to the ability to control your feet and push off with power and change direction and all those different things that come with it. And as this year continues to unfold and the rest of the system arrives in South Africa, they'll start to get the benefits of the accelerating isokinetic machine as well as the specific improvements in rate of force production that the other equipment here provides. So we've been really excited to be involved with them for a lot of reasons, but most importantly their dedication to finding the most scientifically sound principles that they can to best prepare their athletes for one of the toughest sports there is, and that's rugby. The level of contact that these guys are consistently exposed to, the extraordinary needs in terms of their movement, make it one of the more difficult things there is to do in sports and stay healthy. So, so far it's been a very successful relationship. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, it seems like a lot of times that athletes here are doing rehabilitatively what they're also doing in terms of performance gains. Well, that's because the principles of how human anatomy work don't change just because you're injured. One of the things you'll always find is, for instance, you have a back injury or you have a knee injury or anything else, and they're going to be like, well, don't lift weights, because the excessive load is going to make that injury worse. So if your training modality, number one, has to be perfect to avoid injury, that's a problem. And number two, if you're already hurt and you can't use it, then it must be not working on basic anatomical principles that stimulate those areas. By that I mean, if you take, for instance, an ACL. When an ACL ruptures, it generally ruptures right in the middle of it or somewhere in that range. And the current surgery, or best methods, is to remove a piece of the patella tendon. You cut away the ACL and you install that piece of the patella tendon and replace the existing ACL for that. So you've got a couple problems in that. You've opened up the front part of the knee, so now you've got an injury to the patella tendon and you've had to drill holes in the femur and the tibia to be able to replace the pre-existing ACL. You immediately get atrophy in the quad muscles and atrophy throughout the leg because it becomes sedentary and because of the incision here these muscles stop firing. So you have to immediately start getting them working. Any typical physical therapist will tell you that they use a lot of isometrics to get that going initially. They do a lot of manual therapy to try to help flush it and so on. Well, what we do is because the isokinetic device we have has no weight load to it, much like the gears of a bike, very early on in the rehabilitative process, you can start pushing on this that restores the strength of the leg and it does so in a very stimulating fashion without any potential risk to the surgical area. 
And we'll also use water because the water provides resistance again without tremendous weight load. There's no risk in terms of moving the leg in different planes or in different ranges of motion to where we're going to damage the surgically repaired area. So if we're able to do things that highly stimulate very vulnerable areas, then obviously and clearly they would also stimulate things when they're very healthy. And you can do it at a much more intense level, which is what athletes require. The system is based upon principles that reflect how the anatomy works. And how the anatomy works does not change just because you're hurt. The foundation of this company is to provide a culture where athletes can come to learn about how their body works in the sport that they're playing in. The word science exists in the name because the principles that are used here are based on scientific principles that have proven to work. And by that I mean there is not a ton of U.S. based research available if you're going to start studying how to produce a great athlete. Whether it's the study in kinesiology or the study in exercise science, both fall extraordinarily short in terms of teaching you how to train somebody. You will gain tremendous knowledge in terms of understanding, for instance, in kinesiology how joints work, or in exercise science how the energy systems work. For someone like me, I had to go learn those things on my own because I wasn't formally trained in those. And once you understand that the principles are simplistic, you realize that it applies to all sports. And that, again, the human body only works in certain ways. And it doesn't matter what sport you play, your body isn't going to change how it produces maximal force in a throwing motion just because you're now a baseball player instead of a football player. Throwing is throwing. What we are attempting to do is to provide an alternative to the current systems that are out there because I believe they fall extraordinarily short of delivering what athletes need, number one, to stay healthy, but also to be able to drastically improve their performance in their sport. There are different things that we will do here in terms of experimenting new methods of trying to improve gains, whether it's in throwing velocity, height and jumping, running mechanics, things like that, that will directly impact the gains that an athlete has. That involves the feedback of the athletes that come here, many of which are professionals and have their own mindsets about what has made them successful. And that's one of the most useful tools you'll have is learning from the people that are in a competitive environment and what they feel they can rely on. Because at the end of the day, they still have to compete all by themselves. All you can do is best prepare them for that. So the reason the word lab is in the name is to provide an environment where athletes feel comfortable to be able to openly question things, understand the principles that we're using here, and to feel free to bring up new ideas so that we can constantly stretch the boundaries of sports performance games. Long term, our goal is to be able to provide a scientifically based system that improves athletic ability for each and every athlete that comes through here. In that process, we will continue to evolve in terms of pursuing the best ways to do that. All is not known in the world of sports performance. It's an evolving process. And clearly, people have figured out that there is something wrong with the current system of sports performance training. Just because you work out hard doesn't mean that you've improved your sport in any real way. What I am dedicated to doing is that each athlete that comes through here is that they are able to see market gains that they see on the field in their sport that are real. They've got to have tremendous improvement or we're not doing our job.